So you wake up at 7 o'clock this morning with a little time on your hands and you flick on the TV to catch the morning news. And there's a startling news that a huge meteor, three times larger than the earth, is barreling down toward the earth. And they've done all the stuff on the technology to say at 8.37 and 58 seconds it will smash into the earth and obliterate the earth. It will blow off into a million pieces and that will be the end. Just kidding. <laughs> but what if it were true? What would you do today? How would you live? I went to Catholic school for 20 years straight from, to, from 1956 to, uh, nine, uh, to, to 1976. Um, uh, <laughs> and math was not my highest subject, huh? 20 years straight, and I will say, I don't know if this is true for you, but I'm going to bet there were 30 to 40 distinct moments in my education that I re remember with tremendous clarity to this day, but only that in about 20 years. How many thousands of hours did I have a teacher in front of me, and yet there's just moments, and, and I'm going to share one with you this morning. It goes back, I don't remember the grade, but I was very young, and I had the BVM sisters, just like they taught here at St. Charles, and they were tough. Whoo, those were tough sisters. And I remember one, and I think I was second or third grade, and she got up there and she said, what would you do if this were the last day of the world, and it was going to end today, and Jesus was going to come back in his glory and take all the world to himself? What would you do? How would you live? So hands started going up. You know how little kids are. They all have the answer. I would say all my prayers today, sister. Okay, I would go confess my sins and tell God I'm sorry for everything and be very good today. Okay, I would tell my mommy and daddy I love them and clean my room and make my bed. Okay, and, and you know, several others. And then tough sister says, not me. She said, I'd live my life like I do every day. I would teach school and I'd go home and I'd straighten my room and I'd help to prepare dinner and I'd say the prayers and I'd write a few letters and then I'd go to bed like I do every day. I wouldn't change a thing. We're all like this. And she says, because you should live your life like every day is the last day. You shouldn't have to change things and do things better. You should be living your best all the time. And again, my eyes were like, and I never forgot it. And you know, in all her toughness, she was right. How else should we live? This may be the only last day that we have. And I wouldn't be so worried about the end of the world. Oh, we've heard these propositions for years. 2000 was the big one. Wasn't that the biggest hoax of all? And it didn't happen. And even in the gospel, Jesus says in one of the gospels, even I don't know the day, only my heavenly Father. So what are we concerned about? It's kind of like the story of Chicken Little. Can anybody, a child, tell me about Chicken Little? Who knows the story of Chicken Little? Nobody, huh? Oh, my goodness. Where? Where? Oh, shout it out. Tell me. Real loud. Can you get a microphone? They're so shy, aren't they? Look at them. Okay. Oh, here we go. Where was Chicken Little? Where was he standing, sitting? Under what? On the post for it, okay. Well, where'd the acorn come from? Okay, very good, thank you, bravo. Okay. So get the picture, there's Chicken Little, probably twiddling feathers or thumbs or whatever, and a little acorn comes, boom. Now, the wise thing might have been to say, wow, where did that come from? Look around on the ground if there's anything, but what does Chicken Little say? The sky is falling! The sky is falling! Look, it hit me on the head! And Chicken Little runs everywhere to tell this story. Jesus, if he were around, he'd say, uh, take Calm yourself, calm yourself. If he, if he was Latino, Jesus would have said, Calmate, calmate. 
And if Jesus were in 2016, he would have said, Chicken little, chicken little, chill. <laughs> chill. It's not going to, they were all the end of the world, and the sky isn't falling. And so we hear that message in the gospel today. And, and Jesus tells us, you know, all kinds of things will happen. Um, nations will turn against nations. There will be people who come along, as there have been many in our lives, saying, the end of the world is coming, it's going to happen. On 2000, at 12 midnight, don't listen to them. Don't follow them. Chill. And when you see earthquakes and plagues and, and people destroying one another, and we've seen plenty of that this last year, chill. It's not the end of the world. Now, it's interesting. I would be concerned in this last candidacy, I heard more about the button than I want to hear for the rest of my life. And honestly, I must have been sleeping under a rock uh, the same time as my math classes, and I must not have heard about that person that walks around the president 20 feet away with the suitcase all the time. OMG! That is serious stuff. And we're a planet with over 6 billion people. There's a lot of cuckoos out there, you know, a lot of cuckoos. And we've got somebody who is holding a suitcase with all the codes for nuclear disaster. And I know, I, I know this much, we have enough nuclear bombs out there, we could blow the planet up, could we not? We've got the power. Ain't that crazy? Shouldn't we be doing everything we can to dismantle every weapon like that and do whatever it takes to create an atmosphere of peace, not of fear. Let's not even mention this last week. My sadness is for how sad and afraid so many people are right now. Uh, so many people who were not born here and who live here. There's a lot going on out there. But we will not be chicken little. We will not. We will not be chicken little. Interestingly, the scriptures today lay out some pretty uh, amazing uh, terrain for us. The, the second reading, Paul is writing this probably around the year 50. But before we get to this, I want somebody out there to tell me what happened historically on, in the year 7070 in the first century. What happened? You, which? The Temple of Jerusalem was destroyed. The Temple of Jerusalem was the biggest building up to that time, probably. It was amazing. And we even hear a description of it in the, in the gospel. But before that, we'll just say, in 70, it was destroyed. If Paul writes this letter in the 50, 20 years before, the temple is standing. But Paul was telling everybody in his letters, uh, Jesus is coming any day. He died, he rose, he ascended to the Father, he sent the Spirit, but he's coming back. And when he comes back, it's all over. This was the first doomsday. It's all over when he comes back. In the letter to the Corinthians, he even says this. He says, if you're married, because Jesus is coming any day, if you're married, you have to take care of your wife or your husband. That's your, you promised that to God, so do it. But my advice to you, if you're not married, don't. Get married because Jesus is coming any day and you should do everything you can to get ready. He needed that BVM sister to say, just live your life as you always do. But Paul had everybody on pins and needles. Jesus is coming any day and they lived like that. So in this second reading today, he says, however, there are some people out there who are not working. They're sitting around and expecting other people to feed them. I tell you, Get off your duff and get to work. Earn your food. Now, was he saying that the, because they were lazy? Probably not. Probably this was the reason. If Jesus is coming any day, and it could be today, well, why work? Let somebody feed me. Who cares? Here would be a modern version. You watch that about the meteor today, and you know it's coming at 8, 37, and 57 seconds. So you have a nice dinner and everything, your last dinner, the last supper. Are you going to do dishes or not? <laughs> if you're going to do dishes, you are one of those cuckoos, okay? <laughs> Why? 
And that's what Paul is saying, you know, and telling people, you're just sitting around, he's coming any day, and, and there they are. But get to work, who knows, it may not be today. So Jesus in the gospel, he writes this gospel, Luke does, in around 85, 15 years after the temple is destroyed. So everybody who reads this now knows the temple's gone. But he tells a story from the past or makes it up to say this. Visitors came to the temple and they're like this. Wow, look at all the jewels. Wow, look at how big this is. Wow, this has taken 54 years to build up to now. It's not even done. Wow. And Jesus lowers the boom and says, well, don't worry. Eventually, there will be not one stone on another stone. It'll all be destroyed. Now, you read that in the story and say, oh my goodness, but Luke wrote that 15 years after it was already destroyed. So it has an even bigger punch to us who read it. We get it. So what are you to do? What does this all mean? Well, Jesus, the great teacher, cuts through it all and goes to that place for us deep in the spirit, where he invites us to consider what are we supposed to do? We take all of this in, what does it mean? And again, I would say, first of all, he probably would say, chill. Not only should you just not do anything, nor should you panic and worry. Neither will help you. But the question is, how will you live today? How should you live today? And that BVM sister, the tough one, said to all of us, and she made a deep impression on me, a little second or third year old boy, live it like you should live every day, like every day is your last day. You know, since I turned 50, it may have been 49, but I say 50, I have a practice that, that's just become part of my spirituality, and it, it, it's without fail. I get up in the morning, and one of the first things I do is thank God for the day. Especially here at Glassell Park, because I grew up in North Hollywood, in San Fernando Valley, looked at those beautiful mountains. I was right up nestled against the Hollywood Hills, saw all those homes like here, up in the hills, and at night, little like twinkling lights in the hills. I loved it. And then I moved to the South Bay for over 30 years, different parishes, into that flat basin. Came back here to Glassell Park, look at these mountains, I say, oh, God, this is glorious. And the, one of my favorite times, my two favorite times, are early morning and late afternoon, when the shadows hit, when the sun starts to come up and you see the skies brightening, but all of the area here is still dark or in shadow, and then rays of light start hitting. It's magical. You see light here on this part of a house, but the second part of the house isn't, is, is dark. You see the rooftop sunny, but the bottom is dark. And it just keeps broadening. If I look across from my bathroom window, I see across the freeway to Silver Lake, and it's like a mountain of gold. It's all lit up already, and the rest is still struggling with the shadows. So I always say, and half the time out loud, because I'm a little cuckoo, I say, God, thank you. Oh, another day. How beautiful. And if I only have today, it's enough, God. Thank you. You've given me over 66 years of life. Thank you. I don't have any expectation I'll be alive tonight, and I'm not trying to be morose or anything. I don't have a right to it. I don't think, God, if I can't live until tomorrow, I should be upset with you. You've given me 66 years. I'm okay with that. But when I get to the end of the day, again, in my cuckoo out loud, I say, God, thank you. Thank you again. You gave me a whole day. Wow. I may not get up tomorrow, that's okay, but thank you for this day. It's a very important part of my spirituality because for me, it makes every day a day of blessing, a day of grace. Something I don't deserve because I earned it or anything, but it's just a gift. And it also prepares me for the last day because I know it will come. And every single day I say, this could be my last day, and it's okay. So... How will I live it? That's the question. You know, we have so little control of bigger things like what is going to come in the next four years. We have very little control. We have some. We have some voice. Personally, I am very encouraged by all the people who are protesting and walking all over the place. I came home from a play on Friday night. I went to Orange County for this play. 
Came back about 11.50. I'm coming down the freeway 110, zooming down the freeway saying, oh, thank God there's no traffic. And then all the lights start going on. Oh, my God, as I start to come into L.A. I saw a string of police lights on the freeway. What is this? All parked. What is this? So like a typical looky-loo, I looked. No accident, nothing. What is this? <laughs> yes, that's exactly how I felt. I went just a little further, and then I must have seen 60 or 70. I've never seen so many police cars gathered in one place, all the lights going, and I see the crowds going over the overpasses, all peacefully, and voicing their concern. And there are concerns. There's always concerns after any election, always concerns. But the question remains, so how will I live? I hope that everyone here, everyone in our city, everyone in our nation, everyone in our world, really, because an American election has, uh, has world impact. I hope that we will ask that question again and again. So, how will I live? And I'm not meaning just those things about living with love and justice and forgiveness and peace and reaching out and reconciling and serving and having a bit of humility and all those things, those personal things that make up each person. But how will we live in the bigger fabric of life? Use our voice. Use our hands and write letters, even children. I've seen letters get to the president by children that they've read and said, a third grader in Tukabusi, uh, Alaska, wrote this letter, and it moved the president to respond. Many presidents. We have a voice, we have a heart, we have a vision, we have needs, we have hopes, we have rights, we have responsibilities. So, yes, how will you live your life? How will I live my life today? That's the ultimate question that Jesus always puts before us.